Good day, fellow investors. Archigo's list of owned stocks that recently crashed due to a margin call will be the topic of today's videos because I went stock by stock to see if there are some other value investing opportunities out there. As we discussed in the recent Baidu stock analysis, there is some value and the recent technical crash created value there. So I'll go through all the stocks that were impacted by the Archegos default and consequently block trades dumping their holdings onto the market actually the investment bank holdings, not Archegos' holdings. And that's also something we're going to discuss. First the story, then stock by stock to see whether there is opportunity or not. By the end we'll conclude how the market, as Benjamin Graham says, is a voting machine in the short term and a weighing machine in the long term. And that's also a great perspective on this market, on many stocks out there, and something you have to be careful when it comes to investing. If you get value from this, all I ask is just click that like button. Thank you for supporting the channel and let's start. Just some housekeeping. I get a lot of questions and emails and this is a scam that's going on over YouTube and every comment that you make is replied with this. So they take my picture, they impersonate me and they try to scam you by making you call some WhatsApp number and then sell you some cryptocurrencies. Please don't fall for that. I don't know how to protect myself against this because it's really, really crazy. When I reply, there is a clear distinction between my reply and these crazy reply. So I apologize for that. I hope YouTube will improve and protect you from there. Let's start with the story. So Archigos crash, Bill Huang, it's the manager of the hedge fund that crashed the defaulted a few weeks ago when all the investment banks sold blocks of the holdings there and that led to big stock crashes of these stocks. Just for fun, in 2012 he pled guilty to insider trading, paid a fine to settle the guilt, was prohibited from trading from investment banks, but given that he is a big client, big fees, they took him back and gave him more margin. All he did, you, he changed his name from Tiger Asia Fund to Archegos Fund and kept doing business. That's how it's done. Archegos is a fund that they say had about 10 billion in assets under management family fund, but the whole exposure of the fund was, as they say, 50 billion thanks to leverage. And the leverage used were total return swaps, Total return swaps are contracts that allow a user to take on the profits and losses of a portfolio of stocks or other assets in exchange for a fee. That's specially made for big bank clients and also the reason why you would take these swaps is so that you have a big exposure to a stock but you don't own 5% of the company or you don't own 10% of the company which has legal and disclosure repercussions. So you make a contract with an investment bank so that they buy, the investment bank buys the position and you pay a fee for that purchase and simply if the stock goes up you get the money and if the stock goes down you pay for the losses. You have of course some collateral, just 10-20%, that's how from 10 billion he could have positions of 50 billion when the stock started crashing when the collateral was gone, the fund defaulted and the companies, the investment banks, dumped the stocks on the market. Long-term capital management in the 1990s used these swaps and we know how that ended. And in 2002, Warren Buffett made a comment on long-term capital management on how that ended and how the Trades of long-term capital management, a firm unknown to the general public and employing only a few hundred people, could well have posed serious threat to the stability of American markets. And then they discuss how one of the derivatives instruments that long-term capital management used was total return swaps. Contracts that facilitate 100% leverage in various markets, including stocks. For example, Party A 
to a contract, usually a bank, puts up all the money for the purchase of a stock, while party B, without putting up any capital, agrees that at a future date it will receive any gain or pay any loss that the bank realizes. Of course, that for a big fat fee for the bank. Total return swaps of this type make a joke of margin requirements. So, if you're a big bank client, then no margin, no margins, so you can just make these contracts and they're happy to give them contracts at a fee. And then also Charlie and Warren, when they analyze those investment banks, the only thing we understand is that we don't understand how much risk the institution is running. And that's also one of the reasons why I simply don't invest or don't look at banks. You never know what are the derivatives behind those numbers. And when we look at those hits, Credit Suisse took a 5 billion hit, Nomura a 2 billion hit, Goldman managed to get out before the crashes by selling earlier, JP Morgan also did not yet disclose, but just a small management firm did this. So imagine what can happen if the market unravels if the whole market unravels let's now look at the stocks so the first stock that is in a decline also today as process announced that it will sell a stake has been declining a little bit since the peak in february which also triggered part of that sell-off but you see it has started to be volatile i'll discuss tomorrow the issues about the listing companies in the u.s Tencent had just a small crash. It is a big company, so they couldn't impact it so much. Then the recent drop is mostly because Tencent's biggest investor, Prosus, said it will sell a stake of 15 billion. Speaking of valuation, if we go to our valuation table, if we click on Tencent using cash flows, no dividends payouts with growth rates of 25-15%, I get to an intrinsic value much much higher than the current market cap. With more exuberant growth, it is significantly higher. So you can download this, you can play around, so it is undervalued for a 10% return much cheaper than many other comparisons and we'll discuss that also a little bit tomorrow when discussing more Chinese stocks. But Tencent wasn't that impacted apart from the recent decline. Things are volatile and, and that is always interesting to watch. Fundamentally Tencent is undervalued. Another stock that we discussed yesterday that it is not so undervalued as Tencent or Alibaba is Baidu. So you can check that video that I did yesterday. So you will find the link to the video to the template for download to other interesting stocks analysis all in the link in the description below. A stock that really crashed is Vipshop. So a stock that crashed enormously over the period and as the block sales came is really Vipshop. It went from 54 to the current level and that's a 34% decline. So 21% in one day, 29%, 37 at the lows and still very very low. Now let's see if this is an opportunity or it has been just pushed up in momentum. I made a few analysis of Vipshop two years ago when I said that Vipshop is a Chinese growth stock that turned into a value stock. And just look at the long-term trend. It was a hot growth stock, negative, negative, negative. And here, when I made the analysis in November, I said that it is close to being a value stock. Now, after it exploded, now it is again, unfortunately, a growth stock. I looked a little bit at the numbers and the numbers actually aren't that good at all. The growth has slowed down, margins have improved a little bit, earnings are also improving. But when I look at the market capitalization of 140 trillion renminbi and compare it to sales or compare it to profits, we are still at P ratio of 34 for what is slow growth. This is not fast growth. Actually, the sales have declined over the last months according to Morningstar. Then I went to check, of course, the investor presentation and they have this as their investment thesis. So massive potential. And when I see potential from a Chinese company, then you know, 
okay, these guys are selling something. They say revenue, total net revenue is actually higher, so Morningstar might have the wrong number, but growth is 10%, so not that fast from this perspective. Profits have improved. I'm here at five, six billion renminbi net margin for shareholders. However, that is still a price earnings ratio 2030 and you see no dividends so unlikely that you'll see any dividends that soon and you never know the competition there is really really strong with Vipshop with their plans Alibaba is your competitor and you never know whether you can reach scale there or not another stock that has crashed over the sell-off is farfetch down significantly since it started also 30 percent but then when you look at the longer term since the ipo i remember i looked at this company somewhere here don't remember when it was too much growth for me and then i see after the covid crisis people buying more from home especially luxury goods it exploded on the upside but if i look at fundamentals i see huge growth 60 percent growth but i see also a tenfold increase in losses and also share issuance more money burning money and try to compete in a luxury market where i think they have one percent whether they will be able to compete with everyone else there and turn this into profit is something that beats me. So just because the stock exploded on the upside doesn't change anything for me. I think I looked somewhere where it was really cheap here and I didn't like it. So why would I like it now? Even less. iKiwi owned 56% by Baidu. We discussed it and said I'll look into it. So here the story comes. Let's see whether it is a value opportunity or not. Actually, iKiwi is not a growth stock. If we look at sales, sales have been stagnating, losses have improved a little bit, but they are still burning a lot of money. And you can see that the shares are issued constantly and the number of shares outstanding is increased. I read a little bit through the last conference call and you see also number of subscribers declined by 3 million, which was mainly impacted by the lack of top content during the first half of the quarter. Now about content, if people want to watch things like Netflix, then they buy more, then should be growth. We'll see whether with new content, they will be able to attract new customers. That's the game there. It's about reaching scale. But then when you read what they are promoting, entered into a formal agreement with BMW China, and then of course VR. And when I start to see those exuberant terms, selling an investment thesis from these Chinese companies, my head starts hurting. However, what they say is that the only driving costs in the future will be original content and overseas expansion, and that's it. And as the number of members grows, then should also profits based on scale. If they manage to do that, they will be successful and the stock will explode on the upside. But if they don't manage to do it, then it will keep being an ugly situation as it has been since the IPO. So that's the risk and reward. Baidu tried to so sell iKiwi or however it is pronounced to Tencent and Alibaba didn't manage to reach a deal. So that's also another negative. These are all dynamic businesses, so we'll see how it will work over the long term. For now, I prefer Baidu, let's say, to following iKiwi. All right, next stock is Viacom CBS. That was a, also a large position there. And then you can see here a huge crash that's 51%. It was actually the stock that started the sell-off of the Archegos fund because they announced here that they are going to issue shares then investment banks downgraded them already and then the margin calls likely broke because it was a large position there then the investment banks dumped block trades on the market and you can see how something that went up extremely fast over the last year can drop even faster. And this is perhaps an example of what Jeremy Grantham was discussing when we discussed whether we are in a bubble. He said that 
first smaller bubbles will start to burst. And we are seeing now, first we see the tech bubble slowing down a little bit. Now we see these bubbles, streaming bubbles bursting, this bubble bursting. So all these companies that simply have had inflated expectations now are bursting. Will this lead to a long-term bubble burst down the road is something we'll see and we'll be following that around. However, if you avoid these exuberant fundamentals and expectations, you avoid also these crashes. Check the Grant, Jeremy Grantham video, I'll put the link in the description below. And then the question is, of course, is this now value? The stock has stabilized 2% dividend yield, price earnings ratio of just 11, huge investments in the content raise number, what is this? Number five globally. So let's see if this is value. They are increasing those content investments per year. So they want to compete with all the other streamers. That's also why the stock exploded from short covering, from Viacom, using all the content and going into the streaming wars. However, if I look at the financials, actually revenues declined 6%. Free cash flow was okay, almost 2 billion, but just a year ago was much less than 1 billion. Nevertheless, if we look at earnings, earnings per share of around $4. And the key is of course streaming. If they can manage to grow this profitably, then they will be valued as Netflix. But from what I see is everybody's trying to do streaming now. I made a video on Disney and how Disney's streaming content has the same value as Netflix that worked out well for the stock. But as Netflix did it, as Disney did it, now everybody else trying to follow. So at some point, all these guys that try to follow will not be able to succeed or compete or reach profitability. So that's also a risk there. And if we look here at the revenues, those are not growing, those are actually declining. Plus, if we look at the balance sheet, there is growing, growing debt, which was the key issue when it came to the stock price of Viacom declining severely during the March 2020 crash. If I then look at cash flows, what they can do, they have increased their cash position by 2 billion over the last 12 months. However, they have also issued debt for about 1.4 billion extra, which lowers this to 800 billion dividends, 600. So we are at 1.4 billion in real free cash flows. Compare that to the market capitalization. We are now at the price to free cash flow of 20 and above. So that's a little bit risky. And here it was then price to cash flow of 40, 50, which was crazy, insane. And these upside were just momentum trades fueled by margin, as we have seen with the Archegos trades. Here is the announcement that they made in March 24. They announced issuing convertible preferred stocks. They will issue 3 billion in order to pay for the content. So on top of the debt, they will issue more stocks and that is what triggered the crash. And I don't know whether they will now issue again stocks as the stock has crashed and they will have to issue double the number of shares to get to the same money they expected to get when the stock was 100. Next stock, Discovery Communication, also huge run up, run up, and then big, big crash again, 30% just over the last weeks. So price earnings ratio 24, market cap 20 billion. I looked at sales, stagnating sales. So another streaming promise that really isn't yet there with the numbers. I look at the number of shares there, basic compared to diluted. So they have issued probably a lot of preferred shares there to finance also huge debt of 15 billion. And if they don't make it with the streaming, this will be a big issue as it has been in the past. And then you have a very bad investment. So there is potential, but there is also risk. So I prefer to avoid such risks. And this is perhaps the craziest position of all GSX tech edu. If we look at the stock price, it's a recent IPO. So what is this? Less than two years, 
at 10. A lot of Chinese IPOs go public at 10. And then the stock did really, really well in 2020, especially when COVID started, as it gives online education, crashed once, then jumped again to 100. And now, since what happened, we have been down 64%. I looked a little bit at the numbers, crazy numbers, for from 100 million in revenue to almost 6 billion renminbi in revenue. Free cash flow, extremely positive. 1.2 billion renminbi, huge growth, huge potential, huge promises. But then I looked at the investment relation page and it was really ridiculous. And I'm thinking, okay, Muddy Waters must have something on them. Then I Google Muddy Waters, GSX, Tech Edu, and they say that it's a total bot company, total fraud. And I didn't read into the report, but if you're interested, you should, you should read Muddy Waters report. And when I look at these Chinese companies, this is something that might get delisted if they can show the real accounting, which is something we'll talk tomorrow. So you might want to click that subscribe button and that like button. And my conclusion is pretty simple. Benjamin Graham said that the stock market is a voting machine in the short term. And all these ups and downs really expose that how this is all about voting, voting, voting. And then we as investors have to be really thinking about weighing what leads to our long-term returns. And there is also a video that I made a month ago, and I really urge you to look at that and see whether you want to follow the votes or you want to follow the fundamentals. Because if we look at what's going on with the stock market, 2020 explosion in option trades, a lot of people just thinking the stock market is a gambling casino where you can make money so easy. But as the stock market started dropping, so has options cooled off a little bit. But this can all backfire and create opportunities for us that weigh investments through fundamentals. We look at hedge fund leverage size. That is insane. And we can see how they have 20 times, 25 times the top 10 funds of leverage. So leverage ratio is defined as gross asset value divided by net asset value as reported. So this is really, really insane. This means that we will always find market irrationalities that the market is not efficient because if Goldman has to dump 10 billion of value in one day immediately to close their trades, it means the market isn't efficient. The market simply cannot take that. And we have also discussed this in the market inelasticity hypothesis, which is a research done by Harvard professors that showed that $1 going into the market increases the market valuation by $5. The same is, of course, worth in reverse. And that's also a video I urge you to watch to understand better how the market works. Thank you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.